heck? Is that the one where he sucks his queen? No, it's not a variation. It's a system in the King's Indian where white pitches king knights on king two and c3 and I mean, he brings his king knight to, to e2 and then to g3 real quick and plays h4, h5. Okay. It's a weird, it looks like it ain't nothing. Right? Know? Like you what the play like, like you could easily stop it. Not play f3, you play No, he doesn't play it in like the same. Yeah. You play the three Just pawns. shove the rook pawn. Yeah, he has the three in the middle and then he shoves the rook pawn with the support of the knight on g3. And you know, so of course you could stop it and play h4, h5. But then he's got other stuff that happens after that. Right. He his record with that out of like I counted all the games in the chess space of that. His record's like 18 wins, no losses, and six or seven draws or something. Oh, I mean, oh, it's oh, ridiculous. Oh. I couldn't believe this guy. Well, the nobody knew the idea. It's not the awesome. first time well, people see the openings, they don't you know, necessarily. Well, it's not a that particular opening. Some guy named Framer came up with it. And I guess he started playing it in the 60s or, or 70s. And Rimlinger jumped on the bandwagon and no one else did. Well, that would be my time he could play. That's why he knew about it. When he came back, he kept playing this stuff. And everybody had forgotten about it by then. By then it had been like, oh, God, it's nothing. Everybody forgets about it and then you come back with it. The other thing you, they couldn't do back then was he wasn't on the internet. There was no, yeah. probably not much material for him. Now, that's the other thing. People preparing for you. That's, that thing. that's the thing I don't like about it. Nobody's prepared for me. Yeah. No one that's I'm true, but there's a reason. In general, it has to be up there. Yeah, in general, I don't think it matters at a certain point. But at a certain point, uh, people out preparing you is a real issue. And it kind of, I think does diminish just a little bit. So you're really playing somebody's who went and looked you up and memorized a couple lines and you know the, now you're struggling again. So, I've been struggling all my life. So I, I think changing up your openings a lot is a really good. But I can't do that. My, my repertoire is kind of thin. But you know, uh, these kids that are becoming higher rated earlier, like they're like, there's a, why is it, you know, of course, the question is, how can it be you have all these, these 22, 2350 guys between the age of 12 and 16? You know, there's a bunch of them. Right. Okay, there never used to be any like that. I mean, you'd see one a decade, like Harriet or Youngworth. Or, right. They just didn't happen very often. At that age, they so, were always in the top five well, well, in the country. What's Harriet's story? He never played in the tournament. He got to be master of that. So well, he played in tournaments too, but he, he didn't become a strong from playing in tournaments. I mean, he could have. How do you get so strong? From playing at the park. That's all he is. He was a challenger. Did he start real young? Or what? Yeah, he started real young when he was like 10, 10 or 11. Like 10 years old? I think 11. That, that explains a lot. That explains so a lot. The rumors of his demise true these days. I heard it wasn't true. No, he said that. No, there was a rumor like five years ago or something. Yeah, yeah. It had to do with the fact. I heard several things. He was. <laughs> He was like somewhere Western, so when was the last time he was seen by anybody? Well, I think he was out of, was out of the state because of the worst part. That may have been the rumor, too. <coughs> last I saw, he was, I think I saw him at Hollywood Park. He was trying to borrow 40 bucks or something for a steak one night. Mm. Sounds like Harriet, huh? Mm. He was painting curbs in those days. Yeah, it was In fact, the last time I saw him, I just realized it was just a few years ago, he was painting a curb in Hollywood. Oh, okay. I saw him over on He just made this job for himself. Yes. Hey, Hi, ma'am. Would you like a red zone in front of your house? Nobody parks right no, there? No, he gets burnt. <laughs> he makes deals with cities. Contracts. Oh, does he? They go to a city and they'll, they'll say, oh, we got, I guess they bid for it or something. Right. And, and he... He works by himself. I've never seen him. I've seen him working twice. He can Most basically un himself. underbid anybody. <laughs> yeah. And so he goes and he bids and bids for several streets and then he does it for the city and gets paid. Hey, what's that's, out there, Kirby? But what you're saying is another way of doing it, but that's so slow. Uh, it. It's better than I didn't know he went to city. Yeah. I, I get, every so once in a while I get a curb finger knocking on my door. That's Carl's And they're like, I just finished your curb. Here's the, here's the thing. 
twenty dollars. I'm like, what? What? They, they, huh? they do that. They basically will do you the work first, like and then after it's kind of a scam. Yeah. I would. Pay. You don't pay them, do you? I don't pay them. I'm like, I didn't ask for that. And I had a number. I mean. Well, if you do a service for me, I have to ask you for it. Yeah. You can't just do a service right. and then demand it be exactly. paid. Exactly. Yeah. That's not, that's not right. yeah, How do well, I know it was actually? It's obviously not easy. logical because right. what happens when they don't have the money? Then you just walk away. You did the service. You're, they're basically Where's the contract? Where did I sign? Well, you don't have to do it. No. I mean, but they so kind of make it seem like you have to do it. But you're like, hey, this is unsolicited work. I don't have to pay. Yeah. And then, it's like the Irish travelers and, do and that. Plus, I didn't need it. It was already painted. Except they get permission. What they do yeah. is they get they offer you a job. We'll do your driveway, and they really bid low. And okay, you give them a down payment, you never see them again. Right. <laughs> exactly. And the other one is they'll come to your house. And, two days ago, I painted your curb. I'm coming back to collect. You weren't there. And I'm like, how, first of all, how do I know you painted my curb? It was you. And well, look, I got paint stains on my shirt. Yeah, from a couple days ago. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, Most people would give up there, but not Carl. One thing he does not do. I go there. I go there. I go oh, there. I go there. Here. I saw you went here. I went here. Yeah. <laughs> I went the other way. <laughs> I'm going to eat. 
Now you guys know why I call him Dangerous Dante, man. Give it up. Nicely done, Dante. And this is like the first time, well, not the first time, but it's very rare to see Carl loose on time or kind of play under time pressure, you know. It just goes to show you how fast Dante is with his clock. And, you know, <clears throat> I really like his style. I think if you were to summarize his style, well, you have to watch more of his games, but just from this game alone, obviously he's very fast with the clock. Um, he seems to kind of have a wait-and-see approach, and then suddenly he has, like, tactical vision, and he's able to see things move really quickly and um, kind of forces his opponent to to think quick, too, which might lead to mistakes, which we kind of saw here in the game, and... Um, Dante doing a good job of, you know, hard, hardest game to win is a one game, so he's kind of very um, meticulous and um, doing good in that end game. And Carl being a piece down, I mean, you can never underestimate Carl. He's down a piece, but his defensive and end game skills are legendary. So, and he was doing a great job. I mean, battling in that end game, he's chopping off all those pawns. Um, those pawns on, on the left side were rolling up and. There was actually a chance for Carl to kind of get back in the game, which we're going to discuss in the analysis. And as well as we're going to find out what that knockout blow was for Dante. And I think it's going to really help your end game when you see it. So, whew, great game by both. Let me know what you guys thought of the game in the comments below. Um, check out all the Amazon links in the video description as well. And if you're enjoying the channel and you want to help support it, you can become a patron, get access to a ton of cool extras, uh, behind the scenes pictures, videos. Um, uh, interviews and a lot more so definitely check it out you can binge watch a lot of stuff today a uh, link is in the video description all right so in this position um, Dante finds the fork with his tactical vision and um, quick and dirty tr tip I always tell people is um, whenever you have a knight nearby just make sure your pieces are on different color squares because then they won't be forkable but if they are then then they'll be forkable so but you can never count out Carlini and his defensive endgame, his defensive skills and his endgame skills. So um, Carl putting up a good fight, but Dante kind of um, um, doing a good job here. And in the game, we're going to find out the first knockout blow here. And in the game, Dante played knight b5, which is understandable because Rook attacking. So let's go move back. Pause the video. What would you play as white here? All right, this is really cool. You give up the knight by playing d7, and doesn't matter if rook takes because you queen, and this will be a win for for white here. So, yeah, it's kind of like a yeah, it's a sacrifice, but it's kind of hard to see in the end game, you know. So, very very nice uh, sack there that would have sealed the deal. And let's go here in this position here. Carl could have gotten back in the end game. He decided to take the uh, the pawn. Let's go move back. Pause the video. Do you guys see it? He was too worried about that pawn, but the knight was hanging. So another one, another one of those maybe horizontal moves. So a quick way to catch this is uh, ask yourself what changed in the position. So rook was protecting the knight, and so rook takes. I mean, rook takes a knight, and it's fine because um, white cannot queen this. Otherwise, black will. Uh, take so computer actually has white winning here at negative 1.3 so whew, would have been sweet to kind of see this end game here and last but not least let's find another knockout blow for for white as well as um how carl could have uh grinded the game out so we're going to cover two more positions all right so here in this position in the game um let's see dante played rook c7 let's go move back pause the video this is a very nice end game tactic to always remember so um i'll give you a little bit more time for this so pause the video see if you can find it all right so dante was building his end game around um queening this pass pawn so one way to do that is check and purpose of that was to gain a tempo to block black from um, black's access to that pass pawn. So uh, 
black doesn't really have a lot of options. I mean, take, take, and this will queen. So maybe at least get a knight out of it. And this will be winning for for white here. 81.8. I mean, 81.1. That's what the computer has. That's like, what is that, nine queens? Jeez. All right. Last but not least, let's cover this position in the game. King e4 was played. Let's go move back. Pause the video. Will be another move for, for white. I mean, I'm sorry, for black here. All right, black can play king e6, attacking the rook. Let's just say rook h7. And what black can do is counterattack by slowly pushing up these pawns and checking with the rook, keeping an eye on this pawn, though. And white's going to have to pay attention to this part of the, of the game here. So let's just show you some possible continuations here. And... This is basically a grind out position. Computer has mm, the game at 0.7, so slightly better for white, but this is the kind of game that Carl loves. He's just gonna grind his opponent out. Hopefully the opponent makes a mistake, but I'm just showing you one continuation here that might be possible. Um, black going in for the kill, but white's gotta take it out, and white will take it. I mean, black will take out white's pass pawn there, and this could be one continuation. Slightly better for white at 0.8, so. But yeah, really, really fun game between these two. Um, very nice matchup. It's very rare to see Carl lose on time or, or play under pressure under time. So Dante is really, really fast and very tactical, very dangerous, hence the nickname Dangerous Dante. So nicely done, Dante. Good game, Carl. As always, can't count. you cannot count him out, man. His, Carl's defensive and endgame skills are legendary. So nicely done. Great game by both players. Hope you guys enjoyed it and the analysis. Please don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Hit that bell notification and thanks. I'll see you guys later.